Welcome to the Super Sentai Brothers. This is episode 14 of License to Car Ranger, the internet's best and only podcast dedicated to Kekiso Sentai Car Ranger. Every week we watch an episode of the show and we share our thoughts with you, the listener. My name is Matt J. With me as always is my co-host and brother Dave. Dave, how are you doing today? Not bad, man. Not bad. I am very, I'm a lot more relaxed than I've been. My shows are over for the year. So my, my whole life is kind of, I've gotten my life back a little bit. So it's really Congratulations. nice. Congratulations. Very yeah, happy to hear Thank it. you. Show went well this year, so... Yeah, I know that has been. Uh, I know that's been sort of dominating your uh, schedule recently, which yeah, is why you know, man, it. it all it always does. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just like, a huge time thing, but it's fun and yeah. But yeah, it, it sort of dominates our schedule once or twice a year. Um, it has been. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done a regular episode. Yeah, it actually has been. It feels it's good to get back in the saddle. I think. I think since we have done it, the the crocuses have uh, bloomed and then gone away. The daffodils are now out. The the, the trees are budding. Dave, uh, WrestleMania has come and gone. So it's <laughs> all truly the traditional spring. signs of spring. <laughs> Um, but I'm excited, Dave, to uh, shift into this next gear. Of Car Ranger. Um, speaking of that, Dave, today we are watching episode 14. It is called, and I promise you this is not a joke, it is called Full Acceleration into Hellish Lightning. Um, it was uh, written by our old friend, Hirohisa Soda. Original air date was May 31st, 1996. You know, if we keep missing episodes, eventually we are going to be like right on the like the the original air date anniversaries of these things because we're not you too know, far off. I, there's part of me, I don't propose that we purposely get farther behind than we are, but if we do, I think that'll actually kind of be fun in a way. I think it would be fun. Although, if we do that, that means we can't miss episodes anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, but yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, I'm very excited about talking about this episode, Dave. But before we get into that, of course, as always, shining in the heavens, there are five stars. What is our first star of the week? So our first star of the week, Matt, is I'm sure you've seen it. Everybody's seen it. The whole universe has seen it. It's been broadcast into space. Uh, the new Star Wars trailer is out. Yes. And it's, it's super good. Dude, man, I I feel like this is the third or fourth time this has been a star. But the thing about it is, Dave, that Star Wars trailers are always good. Because well, I always love Star Wars, even when Star Wars isn't good. But now Star Wars is good, so I get to love it and not have to apologize to anybody. Well, okay, this is the actual thing I wanted to talk about for a second. Not the fact that the, that the trailer is good. Although it is very good, and I am obviously looking forward to this movie. The thing that I kind of wanted to chat about was that Star Wars trailers are always good. And yeah. they are good in a... Uh, here's the thing that I think is fantastic about a Star Wars trailer. They might be the most perfect trailers because I know... I know nothing about this movie after having watched the trailer. Right. Yeah. The only thing I know about it is the characters that I knew were going to be in it are in it, and, and like o- and they also are Lando. On, yeah, and they are on some level having the conflict that I assumed that they were going to have, and part of it takes place in like a desert world because that's where the trailer is set. But aside from that, like I know nothing about this. I know less about this than I know about like Avengers Endgame which is coming out very soon and is also like a gigantic movie. Mm -hmm. Which I'm also excited about. Which I'm also very excited about, obviously. Also, man, good trailers for Endgame going on. Yeah, they are very good trailers for Endgame, but not as good as the Star Wars trailers. Yes, although, man, okay, let's let's continue to talk about Star Wars. I do have a brief coda on the end of this discussion that I want to say about the, the new Avengers trailers. For sure. And so the thing that I was wondering is like, is it just that they just make very good trailers for these movies because they know it's a super important thing? And I don't think it's just that because obviously Star Wars and Marvel are both owned by Disney. So mm-hmm. they've both got like, they've, I would assume they have like their best people, the best trailer man in the business working on these things. Oh man. And you, I, you, you gotta love a good trailer man. And here's what I'm thinking. I, I think it's just gotta be something about Star Wars specifically 
And I think it's just that Star Wars is so laden with like culturally gigantic symbols Mm -hmm. that they don't actually have to give you very much in order to convey like the vibe of Star Wars, right? Yeah. Well, like Star Star Wars has two things going for it, right? Like Star Wars A is like extremely mythological, right? Like, it's not sci-fi, it's fantasy in yeah. space, but, like, very specifically, it is, like, mythology in space. And so it plays on a lot of the mythological tropes that are sort of, like, built into, like, how human culture has progressed. But also, on top of that, it has this sort of double layer of being pop culture mythology. So it's the right. stuff that resonates with all people like from humanity, but then also resonates specifically with us right now because we grew up with Star Wars. I feel like I'm talking too much about Star Wars being good, but I like it a lot and it's our show. So Well, no, it. no, but no, I think this is the thing is that I think and if you're doing the trailer you can kind of, like, you know all of that stuff. Like, honestly, the new trailer could have just been, like, you see Daisy Ridley's face, and it's, like, a little bit dark, and then you hear the lightsaber noise, like, the... That noise. Uh-huh. And then, like, her face glues blue a little bit, and then, like, that's the end of the trailer. And, like, like, everybody... Star Wars, you know you're buying a ticket. Right, and then, like, you hear, like, a little John Williams score in the background, and then, like, that's it. That's the whole thing. And that's really all you need, because you're like, oh, right, Star Wars, like Star Wars, is less about trying to sell you a ticket than it is like reminding you that Star Wars exists and that there's right. a new one coming out so that you can go see it. Um, but anyways, I think the only I was thinking about it just now. I think the only other thing that you maybe could do that with, if you had a good movie, would be uh, Superman. I think you could do okay. a Superman trailer that was like that kind of minimal. Well, as, as I, minimal as this Star Wars trailer was, and I think it would work. I, I I have said for years that my favorite Superman movie is the trailer to Man of Steel. Like Man of Steel is a bad movie, but the trailer, the trailer to Man for of Steel rules, yeah. is so good and made me feel so like man, like I I gave those DC movies the benefit of the doubt for the long time based on a three minute trailer that was so good. Did I ever tell you that I met a trailer? Um, like editor one time at a hostel in Prague. Huh? No, you definitely did not. Okay, I, I was gonna say some stuff about the the Avengers trailers, but I'm gonna jettison that now to tell you this. Um, one time I was at this hostel in Prague. The hostel was called the Sir Toby. Great place. Had a bar in the basement, and I was sitting in this bar in the basement of the hostel, and I was talking to just some guy who was also there. And that guy, it turned out, his job was he was a trailer man. Like, he edited trailers. And I asked him, what is the trailer that you liked the most that you did? And what is the one that you felt most bad about because you tricked somebody into going to see this movie? And the trailer... Those are two very good questions. I don't know that I would have had the presence of mind to ask that specific question. I mean, I was talking to this guy for a while. And I feel badly because I don't remember the exact answer. The the answer of the one that he liked the most was the trailer for um, Blades of Glory. Well, um, that is a funny trailer and a funny movie. The the one that he felt the most badly about was he did the trailer for one of the uh, Uwe Ball... I, I don't remember which movie it was, except that it was an Uwe Boll movie. It and doesn't. Like, I mean, yeah, you, you've already said enough. Yeah, and he was like, man, they gave me that footage, and I made it look as good as possible. And now, for the rest of my life, I have to know that I convinced people to go see a movie that I knew was bad. <laughs> anyway, movies are great. Movies are great. Matt, what is our second star of the week? You know what might be great and also might be awful? Hmm. I have I, I mean, have been, all sorts of stuff, but I've been playing a video game, Dave. You know how I okay. like to do that. And it's yeah. a Tetris video game. But it's not just a regular Tetris. It is Tetris 99. Oh. Okay. No. Okay. I mean, no. I know that this game exists and that it's Tetris. The, that's all I know about it. Okay, are you an, Okay, that's all you know about it. Here is the deal with Tetris 99. 
Tetris 99 is a Tetris game that is also a battle royale sort of game. Where hmm. not, well, and, I'm immediately less interested. Right. So I I started playing it because I'm like, okay, I love Tetris. Tetris is a game that like I'm not great at Tetris, but I've been playing it for an extremely long time, and I know how Tetris works. Like I I have the theory of Tetris in my brain, even if like the the muscle the right the execution to, is yeah is the execution right, yeah. falls short but i know how tetris is supposed to work so i thought i'm going to play this game here's how it works you and 98 lose. you yes, lose you lose every works. time so it's you and i think 98 other people playing tetris at the same well, time well that would make sense um and you just play tetris to the best of your ability and every time that you clear a row or a series of rows it adds rows to one of the other people that is playing's like board, like randomly. I there is a way to not do it randomly to like target people. I did not get nearly far enough in this game to understand like the mechanics or like theory behind targeting other people. But like, if you're not targeting people, it just sort of like shoots randomly to the other people in the game. Okay. So what the game is is you play Tetris and then to you're the best slowly of your losing, ability, and then okay. and then you're like, oh man, I'm doing so good, and then all of a sudden, like half of the board is just filled up with full blocks, and you cannot win because there is not enough time for you to like get rid of those blocks, and then you get angry, and you're like, man. Maybe I could do better next time. And then you do it again. And it's extremely compelling, but it's also extremely frustrating and heartbreaking and makes me feel bad about a game that I really thought I knew how to play. Um, Listen, dude. No, you made a mistake. You Because here's the thing. You thought you knew how to play a game and then you played that game online. Yes, that is always the problem, right? Like, I, it is a game. Like, I have been playing Tetris. For what, I'm 34 years old? Let's say that I've been playing since I was 14. I'm sure I've played before I was 14. That's two solid decades of Tetris, and mm-hmm. I still am bad at this game. Listen, yeah, I mean, uh, no, Matt, you're not, it's not necessarily that you're bad. You're just not internet good. You're not as good as somebody who has made this their part and or full-time job. Like, don't feel bad about yourself. <laughs> Like, I, I used to play Tetris in class in college. Like, there there were notes that I should have taken about Russian history that I never did because I was playing Tetris. And yet, I still am not good enough to compete with these people. And it drives me crazy because if that's the case, I should have just learned more about Russian history. Like, I shouldn't have wasted the time. <laughs> anyway, Russian history is good, and I guess that Tetris is actually part of it. Uh, so... That's that's all sort of full circle. Dave, what is our third star of the week? So our third star of the week, Matt, is uh it's a it's a vaguely woodworking thing. Okay. So I um I've been working on this project for the twins, and they they love the monkey bars at the playground, and they don't obviously we don't live at a playground. Sure. And so I'm making them some little monkey bars that will live inside the house oh, fun. that they can play on, which will be cool. And so I'm like building this thing and I'm like, oh, like I'll, you know, let me smooth it out. I got this plane to like level things out. And I'm like, man, this, this plane is not working super well. Like, let me go online. And I've, I've kind of set it up as, as best I know how. So like clearly I'm doing, you know, clearly I'm doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. So like, let me go online and I'll find some videos of just like, how do you make a plane be better at its its job. Right. And so the the quick version of it is that I have discovered is sharpening. Like you just have to sharpen it like a lot more than you would think you would. And there's some other things you have to do. But I have started to go down and I've stopped myself, but I have started to like research the rabbit hole of sharpening things. Ooh, I feel like that is a deep rabbit hole. Dude, it's it is extraordinarily deep. Like, so much deeper than you would possibly think. I mean, except, no, you just you did just say that you thought it would went really deep. It goes in. I'm, I'm, I'm sure deep. that even though I think it goes deep, it goes way deeper than I'm thinking that it goes. 
I mean, listen, this is this is the era of the internet, and so you know that like there are just whole forums dedicated to this. And now, uh, thankfully, I have not spent this much money. I did a little research, and I managed to sort of like uh, rig some stuff up for for fairly cheap. But it would you could very easily drop the th- thousands, thousands of dollars. That's so Not many dollars. Thousand, Matt, insane amounts of money on on these things, um, on like s- tools and supplies and like the the thing. Because okay, so like w- basically what you're doing anytime you're sharpening stuff is you're just taking metal off, right? You're taking metal off of uh-huh. of a thing, and so what's left is light sharper, right? This has also led me. Uh, I've had a lot of questions recently about how Wolverine's claws are as sharp as they are. Sure. Because obviously we know they stay sharp because they're adamantium. Of course. But how did they get as sharp as they are? Well, Dave, there's a lot of, there's a lot of question about that. Because of course they were not, you know, they weren't installed as claws. They just formed on top of his pre-existing bone claws. Right. Anyways, I don't want to go down this. So, but and so as you're doing this, you're you're basically just using like fi- think of it like sandpaper, right? You're using finer and finer grits yeah. to remove ever like smaller and smaller particles of metal. But dude, it gets up to like like six. So sandpaper, like sandpaper that almost you you that you could like use to like exfoliate your feet, right? Mm-hmm. Is like fifteen hundred grit. Okay. okay. Uh so these sharpening supplies go up to this is not a joke like 30,000 30,000 grit that's a lot of grit and it's in it's madness there is like a single lone voice of reason in all of this and i've talked about him before his name is paul sellers and he's just this like old english guy who's been doing woodwork for like 60 years uh-huh uh and he's just like uh hey, you know a lot of people Talk about how you have to... I'm not doing his accent right. I'm just doing sort of a vague British accent. Uh-huh. Um, he's, like, he's like, a lot of people talk about you have to have like 16,000 grit. That's crazy. 400 is fine. He's like, I've gone my entire career. Look at this amazing chest I made. Subtext. It's better than anything you'll ever make. <laughs> like, I made it using a, a, a plane that I sharpened to 400 grit. You'll be fine. Uh, but everybody else is like, if you are not sharpening to like 16,000 grit, you may as well be, just be like hitting it with a rock, you caveman. <laughs> um, How dare you? How dare you pretend that you have a sharp tool? Yeah. <laughs> um, you anyways, fool. You absolute clown. How so, could you? <laughs> so I have, I've done some, uh, I have done, so I've, I've started a little bit because I, I messed around with it. I was like, oh, wow, this really is like way better. So I, all these, because everybody was right, right? All the people that know what they're talking about. Turns out they know what they're talking about. And uh, and That's so I started a little bit down the path. And uh, it is, but I'll tell you, dude, it is like sharpening. Like having sharp tools is also great. But the act of sharpening is like deeply satisfying because you're just kind of sitting there. And you're just sort of like, you really feel like a, like a craftsman, even though like you're kind of, in your, my case, you're kind of a schlub. Like you're like, oh, I've got like my stuff and I'm like sending it. And then I'm sort of like wiping it off and looking at it and then going back again. Um, it speaks to something very deep <laughs> in my soul. It's tons of fun. What, Matt, I'll let you know once I get everything sort of like set up and ready to go, I'll uh, I'll report back in. Okay. So what, Matt, is our fourth star of the week? Uh, fourth star, I'm going to blow through this pretty quickly because I really want to talk about our fifth star and we've been going long. Oh um, yeah, we have. But uh, speaking of gear, Dave, maybe twice a year, I get this thought in my head where I think, man, this is the time, finally, at long last, I'm going to get serious about bowling. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Matt, I know you're an uncle, but you're not that much of an uncle, right? Well, De- okay, deep in, know deeply that you in have... me, I, I've got that uncle soul. And part no, of that I... is that I want to bowl all and the time. And I know that you like bowling. Yes, I do. I, I, I like bowling a lot. It's a great game. Um, but I'm like, man, once a year... 
I don't just start thinking about like I should join a league. I'm like I should buy a bowling ball and bowling shoes. Like and that that's as far as I get, right? Like the ball and shoes are as far as I get. And then I go online and I start to look for like man, I can buy this. This stuff is for sale. People buy it all the time. There's a whole industry about, around this. Here's the problem, Dave, with shopping for a bowling ball and bowling shoes online. Is that the aesthetic of bowling that I have grown to appreciate over the years mm-hmm. is the aesthetic of the of the bowling alley, right? You go, you get the shoes. The shoes are like three different colors, and they look like a ska clown wore them one time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the bowling ball is just like one one color, and it has the number of how many pounds the ball weighs, like, imprinted on the ball. And, like, that that is what I want. But when you go to buy a bowling ball and bowling shoes online, that is not what you find. In fact, you need to go out of your way to find something that looks that basic. Because if you want to buy a bowling ball online, bare minimum, you're buying something that looks like a... Like a galaxy. Like a galaxy made out of cosmic fire. Mike, okay, and that's Matt, entry question, level. Yeah, real question, real quick though. Can you buy a replica Carmine the Bowler bowling ball like from the Mystery Men? Dave, the answer is absolutely one hundred percent. You can buy that, but I feel like you can't. Like, like spiritually, you cannot buy that until you are a good bowler. Like, that is not the first bowling ball that you buy. Because if you, sh- if I showed up to a bowling league with, a like, a big clear ball with a skull in it, and then I barely broke 100, like, I could never go to that bowling alley again. But everything looks like they're all covered in, like, yes, here is the scorpion. The scorpion will murder the bowling pins. You don't want the scorpion? That's fine. How do you feel about the viper? No, you're not into the viper. How do you feel about the the claw badger? Are you are you the rhino? The <laughs> rhino destroys everything in its path. <laughs> like this is all how bowling balls look, and so I can't buy one. I Dude, just, listen, I Matt. just want one that's the right weight that I can bring with me that has the number stamped into it, so I can just pretend to be a normal guy but actually have something that works. Matt, do you listen? Do you do you want to be strong like bear? I, uh, Dave, I do want to be strong like fair, but I don't necessarily need to have like the imprint of a snarling bear on top of a like a blue and silver and gold bowling ball that just has the words like "Man, y'all suck." Now it's time for the real bowler to show up. <laughs> Listen, I am sure. Okay, I think you're going about this backwards, Matt. You've got to go to a league. And just, like, go to a league, join, like, a pickup league or something, and tell them, like, hey, listen, man, I kind of want to get into this, but, like, I'm not in the market for the scorpion. Right. So, like, where where can I go? And I'm sure some kindly soul, probably named Stu, will be able to help you out. Right. Like, I... I don't need to buy a bowling... Like, in D&D terms, I do not need to buy the delayed blast fireball of bowling balls. I just want to buy, like, a second-level spell, right? Like, that's not unreasonable. But I don't know if I can use those terms at a bowling league to tell people what I'm into. You know, listen, Matt, if there is any sport where I think you would be okay, I (laughs) I think it's bowling. Unless you count, like, an intramural Quidditch league... At, at a college. Um, I also have like a low key gripe about, about Quidditch leagues because I feel Dave, like if they had, Dave, I'm sorry. Uh, we have been, <laughs> uh, we're on the fourth star and we've been recording for about 25 minutes. I would love to hear your low key gripe about Quidditch leagues. Can we do it next episode? <laughs> yeah, we sure can. Okay. Dave fifth star of the week. Last time that we got together, uh, we, we did something a little special. We had some fun. We did. Uh, we 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 pl- we had a little joke. Played ourselves a prank, um, and we talked about an episode of a show, an episode that did not exist of a show that did not exist. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so this was our fun. This was like the best version of of April Fool's pranks. We did a little a little jokey joke on you guys, 
And uh, we, like Matt says, we we made up an episode of a show, and this year it was Chef Ranger. Yes, we, we, so we thought it would be fun. We we've done one of these before. Last year, of course, we did uh, Puroresu Sentai Ringo Ranger, which was our professional wrestling one. Uh, but this year, this year we have uh, sort of gone to a to a, dug it dug into a new well, and we did Chef. Yes. And uh, we just thought it might be fun to kind of chat about a little bit behind the scenes about kind of uh, how that happens. Yeah, because it's it's one of those like we do it very rarely, but it um, it's always very fun to do. And the the way that we do it is, I think, potentially interesting to hear about. And I hope that it is because this is the only thing we have scheduled for a fifth star. <laughs> um, so, so what we do is we, we start off by sort of kicking some ideas around. We, we had a couple of, um, ideas that I think we're going to try to save for later times because we didn't, we weren't able to sort of like fully flesh them out. We just sort of kicked around themes because like every, you know, obviously every Sentai has a theme, you know, like Car right. Ranger has a car theme. So we're like, okay, what could be the theme of this show? And we, we went through a couple of things before we landed on the Chef Rangers. And the thing about picking a theme is, like, you need to find something where there's enough variety, right? Where, like, each individual person can kind of have their own thing. And you can, even if we're not doing all 50 episodes, obviously, we can build it out in such a way that it seems like there could have been 50 episodes of it. Yeah, like, there's kind of a sweet spot. And also, I feel like we do uh, maybe overly constrict ourselves <laughs> a little bit because it is weirdly important to me and I think to you that whatever concept we come up with, as you mentioned, could theoretically work for an entire season. Yeah, and and there's a, as you say, there's a sweet spot because like, you want to have it be good, right? Like, you want to have it be internally consistent, but what you don't want to do is forget the fact that like if this were a show it would be a sentai show and so the theme would only sort of half make sense like you don't ever want to go too deep in where it's like oh yeah of course all of these like weird bits like fit together in like clockwork because you've really thought through the theme it's like no you're supposed to half think through the theme and then take out like three things and so it's all kind of floating in this weird limbo of like weird sentai soup and then you can do it yeah if you've if you've thought about it too much it kind of falls apart um so what what did did we come up with beforehand so well okay if you are not like super up on the the lore of this uh basically we did not just do chef ranger we did iron chef ranger oh yeah very Uh, specifically yeah, we straight up yoinked all the names and actually a lot of the ranger colors from the old original uh, Iron Chef, uh, Japanese Iron Chef show. Yeah, not, so not like all the names. So like Chen Kenichi, yeah. our yellow ranger was just, that was Iron Chef Chinese, was Chen Kenichi. The, 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 the French chef ranger was a Hiroyuki, based on Hiroyuki Sakai. Uh, and then we, we did kind of uh, get some like slant rhyme versions of names so that we could get two uh, female rangers in there because we didn't want a team of all dudes and all of the oh, other yeah, yeah, dudes. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, we kept uh, most of the same colors uh, that the that the chefs themselves like wore on the show. So the only switch up we did was uh, Iron Chef Japan is usually like blue and gray, and Iron Chef French was red, and we flipped those because, of course, we felt like Iron Chef or Chef Ranger Japan. Would be the Red Ranger, right? I mean, in a and Sentai so we, show, we their of course. Yeah, of course. So uh, we come up with that ahead of time. So we come up with like the theme and the names of the characters, so that we can refer to them as something. And I think we, yeah, we came up with each individual Ranger's theme. So like we knew, uh, you know, Chen Kenichi was going to be the the Chinese Chef Ranger, right? And we knew and, that and, and, Hiroyuki Sakai was going to be the French one, but also a lot of it was just like based on having done a bunch of Sentai stuff. So like once we knew that Chen Kenichi was going to be the Yellow Ranger, we're like, oh well, the Yellow Ranger is always the big strong one. So here are like three things that we already know about him, right? Um, the other thing that we really figured out ahead of time is we we spent a few minutes figuring out what the hook of the villains were going to be. 
So we, yeah, we did not. S- no, we did. We we spent about as much time as on a, as we did last year. Yeah. So we knew that the big villains were going to be like international, like restaurant critics or restaurant tours, and we knew that their thing was that they made uh, monstrous ingredients. So all the monster of the week were going to be food oriented. Yeah, but like honestly, beyond that, we like we kicked a couple of specifics around like just to get ourselves excited about it. But other than that, we just. We had like a brief cheat sheet of like proper nouns, and then the rest of it was mostly improv. Yeah, well, you know, listen, Super Sentai is pretty formulaic. Uh huh. And we've watched a lot of it. And so we just, you know, you just know that like there are certain beats that are always going to happen. Like there's going to be some sort of cold open. The monster probably won't be there, but maybe. Uh, you know, then they have a first encounter with the monster, then they have to, like, go back and figure something out, and, like, what's going on with the monster, and they fight it, and usually they lose, or at least, like, don't win a decisive battle, and then they have to loop back around, and then they win again, and then they summon their giant robot, and then that's it. Yeah, actually, the, the summoning of the giant robot was one of the very few times in the episode where we had to, like, pause and take another minute to figure stuff out, because Dave introduced the idea that a, that a giant robot was showing up, but we had not actually figured out what that giant robot was and what it was made out of yet. Oh, yeah. So we did. We did pause. Because we do try to do these with... Because you know, part of the fun and challenge of it is doing an ad-lib. Yeah. So we really try to keep the, the editing to a minimum. And, and, but we did have to stop and figure out what the giant robot was going to be. And honestly, the um, part of it, I think, that makes it something that you and I feel comfortable doing is that we've played D&D for a very long time. True. And doing these episodes is kind of like doing a two-person D&D game where both people are the player, but instead of having a dungeon master, you, like, we had this sort of, like, the looming structure of, like, what we knew it had to be. Then we were both sort of playing against that. Yeah, so, like, no no individual person was telling us how the story was going, but, like, we know that it has to kind of go in... In a certain direction. Right. Like, our, um, our dungeon master was 45 years of Sentai tradition, basically. Yeah. So, that's... But, I mean, really, that's it. Like, we kind of knock out the broad the broad beats, or the broad strokes, rather. And uh, and everything else is improv, kind of playing to playing to type, like, within the within the oove of Sentai. Yeah. So, that's it, it's very fun for us to do. I hope we get to do more in the future. Um, but, Dave, speaking of things that are very fun... Uh, why don't we take our break? Uh, we're going to go watch episode 14 of Gekiso Sentai Car Ranger. Um, again, written by Hiroshi Soda, May 31st, 1996. You can watch it on the DVDs or on ShoutFactory.tv. Uh, I recommend you do. This is a good one. We will be right back. Okay, we are back. Dave, episode 14, full acceleration to Hellish Lightning. Maybe the most metal title that we've gotten so far. I think not only out of Car Ranger, but maybe all of Sentai that that I can remember. I don't remember anything that sort of like Rammstein-esque uh, before Big this. Fan. I don't just, heads up, I don't know metal bands. I've got like Rammstein and Judas <laughs> I was Priest. Say, that was an interesting pull. And uh, those, that's who I've got. Um, Sabbath, I guess Black Sabbath is a. Are they like metal or are they like proto metal? Are they uh, like I, what? Are they a primordial soup from which metal springs? I was going to say ooze, but yeah. Okay, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, so, anyways, so this episode opens up on Minoru selling. Well, He's at a okay. racetrack. Dave, Sorry. I hate I hate to interrupt you already. Please. But this episode opens with a new opening. Oh, you know what, dude? I had a ton of trouble watching this episode. Like, my internet was all janky. And so I skipped over it. Because oh, I was dude. like, if this is going to be janky, I don't want to waste time okay. on an opening. Here's the thing. Uh, pay attention next episode, then. Because not only is there a new opening, like, video sequence. Okay. They've actually remixed the song. No kidding. Yeah, and, like, it's not that different, right? Like, if it had been a couple of weeks since you'd seen an episode, you might not immediately notice. But, yeah, they remixed the song, kind of, like, sped it up a little bit and recut all of the video stuff for it. 
Um, and apparently, this was the first time in Super Sentai that they had done that. The first and one of two only times that they've done it. Oh. Well, I dig it. So, That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I, mean anyway, I don't dig not it. To, not to derail too much, but I wanted... In, in case someone is coming to this show for, like, I desperately need to get all the details about Car Ranger, I did not want to let that bit of trivia pass us by. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, no, I'll be. Uh, I'll check it out next time. So... After what is apparently a very good opening sequence that I will check out at some point in the future, uh, the episode opens at a racetrack and Minoru is there. And this just seems weird to me because he's selling, like, an, as far as I can tell, like an illegal fuel additive uh-huh. that he says will boost your engine's power by a million. I think he says a million percent. He does. This this turns out to be a lie. Yeah, this is he definitely pops a lie. too pretty quickly, but he uh, is. And plus, he is at a go kart racetrack. Yeah, this is not like NASCAR. This these are children. I want to say I think boosting the power of a go kart by a million percent, boosting the power of any vehicle by a million percent, has got to be just extraordinarily dangerous. And given oh, that he is at, it, it, as it is you say, astonishingly irresponsible, <laughs> a child's a child's recreational driving area. This is wildly irresponsible. Uh, also. So here's my my I'm my theory on this is that this is a side hustle for Minoru because Pegasus Motors does not do this like isn't their thing. They're not a chemical company. They're like an engineering firm. So if if Minoru has access to like ridiculously powerful, they're not actually. But like if he has access to fuel additive supplements, this has got... He has joined an MLM. He's joined a multi-level marketing thing. <laughs> like, this is him on his hustle. He's on his day off. He's trying to make some extra bucks. Um, okay, here, here's my theory on it, Dave. Is that, you know, you've got you've got all five car rangers, right? Like... Right. Uh, like, Kyosuke is the test driver. Um, then, you know, you've got, like, your mechanic, you've got your accountant, you've got your... Right, you've got the whole, you got the whole ...design thing. person. Who has come up with this thing? Dave, if this is, like, making cars go supernaturally fast, then it must involve the magic of the car magic. I feel like this is something that Dapu has created, and that he and Minoru are, like, working aside. This is a... Okay, got it. So, me, so Dapu is his upline. In yes. this case. That is his so, supplier. So he shows up. Um, so he's trying to like, nobody's biting. Well, and nobody except uh, Zelmoda. Lieutenant Zelmoda of the Reckless Driving Tribe, the Bazog Reckless Driving Tribe, just shows up at the at the thing, at the go-kart race. And he says, oh, it'll boost my power by a million percent, eh? Like, hook me up. Does not recognize Minoru. Well, I mean, why would he? Because he's never met Minoru outside of him being the Green Racer. Right, right, right. Well, just, you know, this is a... I actually thought it was fun. This is a, you know, this is a secret identities season. Some seasons have secret identities, some don't. And this one is. So he's like, yeah, hook me up. Like, I'll buy your whole case. Um, He says, I'm trying to break the speed barrier. And I think if you were just a writer... That's like a fun thing to say. If you were a viewer who's really into Flash comics, this has taken on a whole different... That statement takes on a whole different vibe. But it carries through. This is a very Flash-esque episode of Super Sentai. It really is, right? And and also, this does come after... This definitely happens after Infinite Crisis. I'm sorry, Crisis on Infinite Worlds. Um, I, it does not happen before, I don't think that, like, the the Mark Wade run on The Flash, where, like, he really explores the Speed Force stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, there, there, there must have been something like, to this, right? Like, it's not impossible. It's not impossible, is what you're saying. Yes. That, who is it that wrote this one? It's our, uh, Yoshino, right? Yes. Yeah, it is not impossible that Yoshino, like, read some Flash no, I'm sorry, books. this is, this is like, Hirohisa Soda. Oh, sorry. It's, so it is not impossible that uh, Hirohisa Soda picked up some Flash books. It was like, I can probably cops. I don't think anybody will. No. Yeah, I could do this. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Well, we'll hit some more of this later. Speaking of 
Do you still watch the Flash TV show? You know, I, I have fallen off on it. I really liked the show, but I'm not good at keeping up with TV shows. I also, I'm like two seasons behind. And it's, again, not because I don't, we've talked about how much I love this show. It's a great show. I just don't watch TV anymore. Like, basically ever. I just don't have time. So I, I anyways, watch one show regularly, and it's this one. <laughs> Honestly. So anyways... Um, so Zelmoda, he he, yeah. co- he shows up. He's like, man, if this is going to boost my speed by a million percent, I want it. Hey, also, are you telling the truth? Does it do it? And Minoru is like still in salesman mode because he doesn't want to like break his secret identity. He's like, well, okay, here's the deal. Actually, it will increase your speed by 10%, but man, it's going to feel so good. It's going to feel like it's a million percent. Zelmoda just says, good enough for me. Uh, he takes it. Minoru, I just, I love, like, he just, he's like, hey, 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 uh, you do need to pay for that. Yes. So, <laughs> it doesn't just let the evil space villain, who is his mortal enemy, roll. He's like, I do, I do need that cold hard cash. I do need one million yen, please. Yeah. So, he pays him with, like, dimes. Uh, he just, like, turns the wumper bucket upside down and just starts dumping money into his hands. Um... Which Mitaru is, like, disturbed by. So, what? Zelmoda, the next thing we see is Zelmoda, and he's on his bike, and he is racing. He's got a truly unique bike helmet. Yes, I appreciate... The- it seems weird to me that he has a bike helmet, aside from the fact that I think they're just trying to be responsible role models, like, for the actual children who watch the show. Right. Like, he, of course, is a reckless driver, but the writers of the show are not, and so they put him in a bike helmet. But Zelmoda's head is in a horrible shape. You know, it's a, it's it's a like horrible, a weird... twisted monster head. Yeah. And so his helmet is like this... It is truly bizarre. So he's blast, and he is, he's going faster. It's like whatever the supplement is that Minoru has given him, like it does work. Well, and definitely so, does his stuff. Yeah, so Zelmoda's flying by. Minoru apparently has like ducked off to the side, Excel changed, and is now trying to pull Zelmoda over. As he's flying down, Signal Man pulls up and tries to pull them both over. Signal Man, I love you. I do, I would love if you paid some kind of attention to your surroundings. Right. Signal Man is very black and white. He does not care who is speeding. He just cares that he has seen people speeding and he needs to give them citations. Is he just, okay, Signal Man, lawful good, then I would say. Yeah. Right? Like, I think that's actually a really good... That's a very good definition of lawful good. Like, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I know we're allies, but you did break the law, and I need to give you a space ticket. So, so Minoru is like, listen, I understand what you're trying to do, but please look in front of us a little bit. Zelmoda is driving so quickly, and we need to do something about it. Yeah, so Zelmoda, he's, he's racing, and I think uh, it, we took a minute between... Our, our timing got weird this week, guys. Sorry. Matt, is he is this voiceover where he is talking about the Baki Baki legend? No. Okay, so here is what happens. We next cut to um, the BB Saloon on Barabarian, right? That's right. So this is like a flashback moment. Right. Well, no, I think they are watching him do this on their, like, uh, on their monitors. That's right. That's right. Thank you. And, and uh, Inventor Grotch is like, man... Why is he so dedicated to going, like, just a little bit faster? He's really pushing it. Right, like, I, th- I dig it, but... And all of a sudden, President Gynamo was like, oh my gosh. He's I doing... know what he's doing. He's going for it. He's he's going the distance. He is going for speed. Um, He is trying to break the Baki... He's trying to match the Baki Baki legend. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's the Baki Baki legend. This... Sorry. So he's about to go into some stuff. Let me just say right now. This... I was not too super keen on President Gynamo outside of his great name or Zelmoda as, like, villains. Like, there, it's like, all right, they're fine. This episode really, like... Dude, after this episode, I am half rooting for them. I was going to say, I'm so actually much. a little... I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm way more into Gynabo and Zelmoda than I am into Dapu. That's fair. That's yeah. absolutely fair. Now, it should be remembered that President Gynabo does 
explode planets. He does yes, do that. Yes, he explodes planets out of his sheer... He explodes planets because he's so horny. Yeah, so that <laughs> is not a great look, President Gynamo. But but this episode, it, it does do a lot for, for my opinion of him. So he's like... So Gynamo explains. He says, the Bakibaki legend is a speed barrier that has never been broken. Yes. And legend says that whoever breaks that barrier will become a hero with unbelievable powers. Right. And, and as he is saying this, we see a like montage of painted images of Zelmoda having been transformed into like a Godzilla style kaiju, but like very definitely still Zelmoda with his weird head just crushing the car rangers. And President Gandamo says like, "Oh, I get it." Now that Signal Man is here, Zelmoda is worried that we're not going to win. And so he is pushing himself to like earn this weird legendary power so that we can turn the tide against Signal Man and the Car Rangers. Like, and he, like, he, okay, so he does have like a weird inanimate monster face, but he definitely does seem to choke up for a second. He's like, Zelmoda, man, like this guy. This guy, he's doing it. He's going for it. Uh, now, so we go back from there to Zalmoda, and mm-hmm. Zalmoda is going very, very fast. And he's starting to push past the barrier. Yeah. You can tell, like, because we... there's, like... And, man, this feels very Flash, because not only does, like, weird lightning start to form around him, it is, like, straight-up reverse Flash red lightning. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> right? I'm not making this no, up, it is. right? It is absolutely Ebert Thawne, uh, Like, he, yeah, he's a bad guy. And so, as he is going, uh, it it creates this, like, the lightning and whatever. It creates, like, a whirlwind behind him of, of energy, I guess, or wind mm-hmm. or something. And it flies up into the sky, and it immediately creates a thunderstorm, which blasts Zelmoda. I don't think, like, on purpose. It just, you know, it blasts him. The thing is, I don't think it actually hits Zelmoda. It's just that Zelmoda hears the thunder and sees the lightning and freaks out and, like, just, like, drops the bike and crashes. Oh, that's right. Now, when that happens, Minoru also kind of flips out. Yes, but like, he is he a little just, bit he's behind, super so he's not like yeah. he's not like in he's not in the blast zone of the lightning. So he and Signal Man show up to where Zelmoda has crashed, and Signal Man is like, "Man, what happened to you?" And Minoru, because Minoru is amazing, says, "Oh, well, of course. What's happened here is that he's so terrified of the Green Racer that he wasn't even able to continue to run away from us." And then as soon as he says this, the lightning strikes again, and Minoru, who had apparently been able to keep it together until this point, completely flips out with this lightning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Zelmoda unleashes the Wumpers. Minoru is totally... He's useless. Like, he can't do anything. He's literally, like, clinging to Signal Man. Right. For, Signal for Man comfort, is, I guess. Signal Man is trying to beat up all the Wumpers and also arrest Zelmoda, but he can't because Minoru is freaking out so much and just, like, grasping his arm. Be like, no, we need to run. The lightning. The lightning. There's so much of it. So Zelmoda definitely gets away. Mm-hmm. And we go from there just back to Pegasus Motors. Where everyone other, is so disappointed. They are. All four Rangers and Dapu, I think, have like lined up at a table and you're just staring at Minoru disapprovingly. And it's like, like it's super like, harsh. They're like, dude, you are one of the car rangers. Uh, it, it's Naoki who says this. And as he says, like, dude, you're one of the car rangers, he does the little like car ranger pose with the thumbs up. But it's like, like on, a super, uh, it's like a very chill, it's like the very conversational version of right. Kevin going through the whole pose. He's like, dude, like, we're car rangers. Like, what's going on? And Minoru goes into his sad, tragic electricity backstory, which of so course here, he has. Yeah, so here is the sad, tragic electricity backstory. He's fishing as a child. He was fishing, and he was trying to catch uh, eels for his dinner. 
And all the other kids were like, Aminaru, we need to go in. There's a lightning storm coming. Aminaru's like, no, just a minute. Let me get this fish, though. And he does. And then he is struck by lightning. Yes. Now, I want to say, I think Minoru has the completely wrong perspective on this. Because as a child, he gets blasted by lightning. And the only thing that happens to him is that he gets, like, soot on his body and is, like, knocked back a little bit. Like, dude right. gets up, dusts himself off, and walks home. Minoru, let me tell you, if there's apparently one natural force in the universe you don't need to be worried about, it's lightning for some reason. You right. should be you, dead. Exactly. You have some weird, like, almost immunity to lightning. But this this tale, this tragic tale of eel woe, has made him f- afraid of lightning for the rest of his life. Or at yes. least up until this point. Uh, <laughs> and they just come back. The rangers, stone-faced. They do not care at all. Like, right. dude, we are... We're re- like you need to get past yeah. this. This is the, absurd. The only one who is concerned about anything, and no one is concerned about this lightning. But Dapu says to himself, "Like man, like this lightning stuff is whatever. The thing that I am concerned about is that Zelmoda is trying to like rival the Baki Baki legend." Yeah, because he's the only one who knows what it is, of course. Right. Oh, uh, Minoru does say he's like, "Hey, this is not just like Zelmoda was also super super freaked out about this lightning. Like this is not just me." Right, lightning it's is scary. bad. Watch lightning out for scary. it. So we go from there to the BB saloon, and Zelmoda is spilling his guts to President Kainamo. Right, and by He's the way, like, they are the only people in the bar. The rest which, of the bar has been cleared out for this conversation. Dude, which I think, I actually, I didn't think about it until you said it. But if you are right, of course. And it, it really makes this scene so much better. It does. Um, Like, they're just having this awesome heart-to-heart Zelmoda is like, Gynamo, I just, dude, I want to do this thing, like, for you, for me, like, for us, like, for the for the Bozo Crackless Driving Tribe. But Lightning, it, I just, I can't get past it. He says, let me right. tell you why. And now we get his tragic Lightning pack story. Yeah, so first of all, uh, we see Zelmoda as a child, and that is a nightmare that should not exist. No, I, I want to describe it to you, but I also don't want to put that image in your mind. Yeah, it's, if listen, w- trigger warning for for d- decency. It's terrible, like, it's terrible, like, it's just gross and weird. Now maybe I feel like I'm overselling it. For the no, sake yeah, of basically, the he, he is a teen. He is wearing, like, a varsity jacket, but his head is still the horrifying Zelmoda head. But it has, like, a little tuft of hair coming out of, like, the top point of it. It's uh, extraordinarily upsetting. Yeah. So, oh, man, I do just want to say I have been listening to Going the Distance by Cake in the background, and it's kind of working for me. It's like I have, like, a personal soundtrack for the podcast. Dude, it's a jam. That, like, nobody else is hearing, but it is a straight jam. I actually listened to a bunch of Cake the other week because I just sort of remembered. I remembered about Cake. Dude, I go through those phases. Every once, like, once or twice a year, I just remember Cake, and then I have a Cake week. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, yeah, these guys are great. Uh, anyways, so he is on whatever, like, desolate hell planet Zelmoda grew up on, and there's a lightning storm, and he's sort of, like, jumping and sticking around. He's like, ha, 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 lightning. Like, y- you got nothing on me, I-, I guess. He's, like, taunting lightning, which just seems like a weird thing to do, and he pulls his shirt up, and he's like, even my belly button taunts you. If somebody can explain to me, like, the Japanese belly button thing, I would be indebted to you. Because they're, like, it comes up enough. Right. This is the second like time in this season. Thing. Yeah. And I just have no, I have no idea what's up with that. Now, that either means that this is a Japanese thing that we don't know about, or this is specifically a Bozok thing. Man, okay. Well, that could be. That could be. Uh, so, anyways. I would be interested to know. He he shows the lightning, his belly button, and then he gets blasted in the belly button by lightning, and then right that in the is, button, yeah, and then he he freaks out about it. So, and he's like, dude, every time I'm I'm close to breaking the barrier, I I it creates lightning. Like it's just like the act of doing this creates lightning, and right, then I get freaked like, out. Once, like once I hit that speed. 
what happens is that like it creates turbulence in the air and that turbulence like kicks up the atmosphere and makes a thunderstorm so every time I try to break this barrier, I'm going to run into the same lightning problem. Because the thing was that Gynamo was like, oh, like, listen, I totally understand being afraid of lightning, but don't worry, lightning doesn't come around a lot. Like, that's a pretty uncommon phenomenon. He's really like, no, this it. actually happens every single time. And then Gynamo was like, listen, we're in this together, like you and me, Zalmoda. And then we get a flashback. Like, even if it's just the two of us, we are a team. Right. And we get this awesome flashback of them, like, basically as, like, it's the same costumes. But as, like, young President Gynamo and young Zelmoda just, like, raising hell yeah. on the space highways. Like, back and, like, when being... they were, like, when the Bozoak was just the two of them. Uh, and they had, like, a flag and they're just, like, super bros. Yeah, and there's this moment at the end of the flashback where, like, they had been fighting people in space. And they're, like, kind of beaten up. Like, you can tell that they are damaged because they're wearing some bandages. Yeah. But that they had ultimately been triumphant over what they were doing. And they're, like, you know, struggling to, like, give each other a bro high five. And they were like, yes, no matter what happens, the two of us... We will raise our flag over this galaxy. And it's so good. These guys rule. I did yeah. not know how much these guys ruled until this episode. And now I'm going to be super bummed when one or both of them get exploded. Yeah. So President Gunn was like, Zelmoda, like, it's you and me. It's always been you and me. Like, I'll do it. Like, right. like let me borrow your bike because, like, you, you've got the kick in a spike, I guess. Right, like, and like, like I can't let you take all of the risks. Like, I know that you want to take the risks because I'm the leader, and so like I need to be safe. But like, but we're I, like we're the I, reckless I, driving tribe, dude. Like, I'll I'll do it. Right, like I can't let you take all the risks. Like, I also need to be able to do this for you, for us, for the Bozoak. And so Moda looks at him. He's like, "You would be willing to go that far for me? That's amazing." And then he jacks him in the face and knocks him out. Yes. And then he runs back to Earth. He's like, this is my mission. I will accomplish it. I will like, do it for, for you and for me. And it's going to be amazing. Oh, I've my got gosh, to make this so happen. Um, so, he, so he goes down. And uh, basically he does it. Right, like, this moment has been enough of a pep talk that Zelmoda just no longer fears the lightning. Or rather, he is able to work through his fear to make it happen. Yeah. So he does it. He breaks the Baki Baki barrier. Here's my only problem with this episode. Okay. I feel like this, this whole thing should have been, like, a much... This episode is, like, man, I'm going to say, like, 30 episodes early. They should yeah, have kept this you. one in their back pocket and made what is about to happen like a much, much bigger thing. Like for the end of the season, rather than having it be like a monster of the week this this early on. Um, right. Because what happens is that apparently the legend of the like the Baki Baki legend has been misinterpreted. Because the legendary power is not that Zelmoda is now all powerful. It's that there was a being who existed beyond the Baki Baki legend barrier, like the speed barrier, who has been freed like a like a speed genie. Yeah. Which so is amazing. What? Yeah, so it it's... Is, I don't want to take that away from this. This is great. No, yeah. I, no, no, no. I, it's, it's super great. It's so great. Like, again, my only problem with it is that they, they didn't do enough with this fantastic idea that they had. So here is what this creature is. It's called Electina. Electina? Elequinta. Elequinta, that's right. Right. It's Elequinta. And Elequinta is if there was a version of the Flash from the future where the Flash becomes like an evil warlord and Mm -hmm. gets totally jacked, bro. Uh, Dave, can I I give an alternate DC Comics explanation as to what this guy looks like? He is like a cross between the Red Tornado and the Thunderbolt from the Justice Society. Oh yeah, that also works really well. Thank you. I I I, I spent some time on that one. Yeah. 
So anyways, so La El- El- Quinta, right? I, I know it sounds like you're saying La Quinta, like La Quinta Inn, the, yeah. the hotel chain. And it's very much like that, but it's it's not quite. It's not quite. So Ella Quinta's like, hey, what's up? Like, you did it. Like, you, you did the thing. Great job. Oh, also, Ella Quinta has his own motorcycle. Oh, yeah. And there's a big uh, plus sign on it. Yes. And so Ella Quinta's like... Sick, you did it. Like you have unlocked the power. You and me, like we're gonna we're gonna do this thing. And so he puts like a minus signal symbol on uh, Zalmoda's bike, and now it's like plus and minus, positive and negative charge. They are able to to do like super lightning blasts. Right. They have like sort of like combo abilities. Yes. So the 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 car rangers all show up. But they have showed up too late now because, of course, now Zomoda and Ilakinta have this like legendary lightning power, and they get one hundred percent destroyed by the lightning. Yeah, it's it's not even a contest. Um, it's very cool. Yeah, they get wrecked, and so it's actually so they're they're there fighting, and uh, as soon as the lightning kind of hits, again, Minoru flips out like he mm-hmm. cannot handle it. Uh, and he just runs. See, this This is where the episode has some trouble for me, because the timeline gets extremely hard to follow. Yeah, because we're going we, to have, like, a whole sequence with Minoru here. And at the, like, in the sequ- it seems to be happening at the same time that Kyosuke and Naoki are just getting rocked right. by Helikita so- and Zomoda. Everything, like that we're, everything that we're about to explain happens at the same time that Kyosuke and Naoki are just getting electrocuted by super-powered monsters. Yeah. Okay, so Minoru runs away. He is chased by um, uh, Yoko and uh, Natsumi, right? Yeah. So And they, Dapu. Dapu's on right, the scene. And Dapu has like shown up. And so they run up and they're just like, dude... What, like, what is going on? And he's like, man, I told you, I have gotten a thing about lightning. And they're like, get it together. Like, we're the car rangers. He's like, yeah, that'd be real cool. I would love to get it together. But you, I may have mentioned, I've got a thing about, they don't call it a phobia because it's rational. Right. Like, I've just got it, like, you know, I got nothing, man. So, so Dapu walks up. He's like, listen, man, I get it. Hey, real quick though, could you, for me, as a favor, reach your hand into this bucket? And Minoru reaches into the bucket. Is like, oh, Minoru this- guileless, guileless. He's just like, what? Oh yeah, for sure, like Dapu, a, no problem. Like like a child, Dapu, my friend. Like, let me just put this hand. In, let me put my hand in a covered bucket. Great. Reaches in, and the bucket is full of eels. He's like, oh man. Well, it's okay. It's got like one eel in it. Okay. A bucket like, full of eels is a sort of horrifying visual. I mean, listen, a bucket full of one eel would not sit super great with me, but Minoru likes eels, I guess, or at, le- at least likes eating them. And he picks them up. He's like, ah, yes, the noble eel. <laughs> so delicious. <laughs> and then he gets electrocuted. Right. And Dappy's like, aha, I gotcha. These are electric eels from the Amazon. I'm training you to deal with electricity. Just okay. Just as a side note, these 100 percent are not electric eels. From oh, the not even Those a little bad bit. Boys are gigantic. These are these are eating eels. And Dapu's like, right now you're fine. Like you get shocked by an electric eel, you realize it's not a big deal. You can go fight. Um, Minoru continues to flip out, and he yes. just like he runs away. The girls are like, Dapu, what? What were you thinking? And he's like. Oh, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I don't know. I'm an idiot from space. It seems cool. <laughs> Did you guys... For- I have car magic, but you guys seem to have forgotten that I am a literal child. Yeah. So... So, <laughs> so, so uh, we go back... And again, to, as a reminder, at the same time, Kyosuke and Naoki are being electrocuted to death by yeah, Zelmoda and Alakinta. We see, see, see some of that. So we go from there, and then there's like a little spot in the woods... And Minoru's just sort of wandering around, and he happens upon uh, uh, Yoko and Natsumi, Natsumi and Dapu and Dapu, and they're just and they're cooking like, up a little meal. They just got a campfire going. They got a little, yeah, they got a little charcoal fire, and they're cooking up some eels. Minoru, because he's a dummy, does not put two and two together. 
But he's like, oh man, you guys have grilled deals? I love grilled deals. They're like, yeah, we know. You seem kind of down. We've made you some grilled deals. Go to town, buddy. Yeah. So, so he just hops in. He starts eating the eels. Yoko is looking at him in a very like, oh boy, this is probably going to go wrong sort of face. But everything's cool. He's eating the eels. He gobbles them down. He's so satisfied. He's having a great afternoon while his friends are being electrocuted to death. Yeah. And then Dapu sort of sidles up to him. He's like, hey, man, you know what you just ate? It's those electric eels. <laughs> <laughs> and at first, Mitaru kind of flips out. Right. Oh, also, and- there is there is a like a special effect where he get, is being zapped from the inside by the eels he just ate. Yeah. They did not zap them while he was eating them, just having finished them now. Now that it's just, this is like a Bugs Bunny on a cliff, like now that he knows mm-hmm. they're electric. Uh, and so at first he starts to flip out. And then I can't remember who, but one of the three is like, no, 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 dude. You, like, you beat it. You've conquered electricity as... Eel sonified in in this eel. <laughs> like the eel makes electricity. You were scared of electricity, but you ate the eel, so you beat electricity. Yeah. And, and now Minu, <laughs> he totally and buys like, into this. And now he Minu's is like, filled with right. electricity power. I did. I def- I defeated electricity all of it. I defeated all of electricity by eating this <laughs> one eel. It's just like, let's go. And then he does a very good engine. Yes, he is way too energetic for the remainder of this episode. As though he is, like, overcharged with power and cannot stand still. So, uh, he he, jo- he goes back, he joins the fight, and then, of course, uh, you know, uh, Yuko and uh, Natsumiju as well. Mm-hmm. And, the, the, you know, they get some licks in, and then Alakinta, there we go, mm-hmm. Elekinta and Zomoda unleash like another. It's actually a very cool attack. They just are driving around in, in circles and it's creating this like electricity tornado. Right. Uh, and, which is and, awesome. And everybody else is being affected by the electricity, but Minoru has eaten the eel. And he's <laughs> and like, so, no. Well, I think he's just. And he just hulks the, out, basically. Yeah, well, I think this is. It's not really that impressive because we've already established that Minoru, for some reason, is like basically immune to electric blasts. Right. But now so he, he just remembers that. Yes. So he's being zapped by all this electricity and just starts like busting through it and punching Zelmoda in the face. And Zelmoda's like, no, how could this happen? I got the legendary power. And Minoru just says like, dude, I ate some meals. Now I'm good. And to his credit, Zelmoda says, that doesn't make any sense. You're an idiot. <laughs> so I don't know if the show is trying to tell us that Minoru is, in, is invincible to electricity, but he only needs to realize it. Or if the show is telling us that Minoru is so dumb that he could like be tricked into thinking that he is invincible, like his idiocy bends reality around yeah. itself. Um, well, either way, it works. At some uh, point, one of them like does like a sick like dirt bike jump towards him to crash into him. He catches them out of the air and throws them and the motorcycle halfway across the quarry. It's extremely good. Yeah, Minoru, it, yeah, he's great in this. So then uh, Alakinta, he's just like, okay, I'm kind of done with this. So he grabs both motorcycles, like the positive and the negative, and morphs them into like battle wands Mm -hmm. and just starts using those to blast the rangers well also he grows oh that's why he grows like by himself right which Zomoda is super impressed by he's like wow you could just do that like you didn't even need to eat any emo yokan the one thing that of course we all know causes people to grow So he grows giant. Signal Man is furious because he feels as though he should have been asked to give permission for this guy to grow giant. So he summons Sirender, his giant robot. Yeah. So they summon, he summons Sirender. Um, he starts he starts fighting giant Elikinta. It actually doesn't go super well at first uh, because Sirender is entirely made out of metal, which is conductive. Mm-hmm. And so, and has a lot of attacks that, in, well, he's just got the one big one where he shoots like a handcuff at you. Yeah. And so then, like, 
the electricity gets blasted, zapped like right. down through the handcuff. But then RV Robo has been summoned and he's on the way. RV Robo also gets summoned by electricity. I'm sorry, not summoned by, zapped by electricity. Everyone else is having a bad time. Minoru's like, dude, don't worry about it. It's just like a little zap. We're all good. Let's murder this fool. <laughs> um, and to his credit, that is precisely what they do. Yeah. So that's it. That's the end of LA Quinta. Yeah, that is the and end I of was the legendary really, power. Yeah, I was, again, I really feel like they should have tucked this idea away. And this this should have been like a late 40s episode. Mm-hmm. And LA Quinta should have stuck around for a few episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I really like is right after this, before we get to the end of the episode, we have a brief aside back in the, Bar- Bar- the BB Saloon on Barabarian. And it's President Gynamo and Zelmoda. And, like, Zelmoda's plan didn't work, right? Like, he knocked out President Gynamo. He did it himself. And it still didn't work. But the two of them are sitting at the bar together. And they're like, man, this one didn't work. But you know what? You and me, we're going to make this happen. Like, we're bros till the end. Like, let's murder these fools. Um, And again, man, I'm... I mean, At I, this point, I, I don't I'm kind want the, of rooting for them. I don't want the Car Rangers to lose, but I also, I don't know, like, I, this I, is the I, most, I think, in any season that I have been secretly, I guess I'm telling you right now, so it's not a secret, that I have been rooting for the villains to get, like, a face turn at the end and, like, not get killed. You know, yeah, it's not that I want the Car Rangers to lose, because, of course, they're defending Earth, but, like... I'm not invested in the Car Rangers winning. You right. know what I mean? Like, when it was the Jetman, I was just like, yes, I want you guys to win. With At this point, with the Car Rangers, I'm like, well, you guys are going to win. And like, I, I guess I do because I live on Earth and you're defending Earth. But, like, I'm not emotionally invested in you winning in that, in that same way. Right. Uh, like, so you, we, are, you are not as cool of a team as President Gynamo and Zelmoda. Yeah. So... We just we go from there back to Pegasus Motors, and Minoru he's so excited. He's like, "Guys, you helped me out so much. I you helped me get over this like lifelong thing. I have gotten everybody. I got everybody lunch. It's on me. Grill deals, just regular grill deals. I would assume. But yeah, like, he does specifically say that they are not electric eels. He says that oh, they are right. eclectic eels. Ha ha ha! And then everybody laughs. Uh, because he cannot afford electric eels because payday has not come around yet. Yeah, and then they do present him, Yuko and uh, Natsumi, do present him with the bill for the electric eels that they that they fed him. And he's and like, the, and he immediately freaks out. He's like, "Oh, uh, hey, you guys are currently eating my the rice balls that I ordered, so you're all gonna chip in on this stuff, right?" And then all of them say, "Ha ha ha! No, you idiot! Now you're broke!" And then the episode ends. <laughs> That's it. With him begging his friends for help, <laughs> and them all eating his good good food. <laughs> it's an extremely good episode. So, um, yeah. So that Matt is the end of the episode, but of course. It's not the end of our episode. No, Dave, because first, you and I need to determine where Ila Quinta falls in the creature of Royale. And Dave, I love this guy. I, okay, I am really into this guy. The only thing that I think he's going to get dinged for, and this doesn't come up a lot, but it does come up occasionally, is like wasted potential. Yeah, it does. I mean... This guy could have, as you said, if he had come up in 30 episodes, he could have been, like, the penultimate dude of this season. Yeah, like, easily, easily. Okay, so you know what? Here's where I think we should start. I think we should start with Iron Mask Cherio. Because I feel like he operates in a, like, it's that same, same vibe for me, right? Super cool villain, has a lot of potential, didn't actually stick around that much. Right. Came um, sort of too early in the season to have the impact that he was suppo- that he could have. So, now, I think I think Iron Mask Toru is better than Elekinta. Yeah, because the, I mean, okay, Elekinta is kind as you say, I think he's equivalent to an Iron Mask Toru. I think that Elekinta is a great example of a character where like 
he is not the the thrust of the episode, right? Like the plan, like the evil plan to destroy the Car Rangers is not his plan. He right. is just sort of like a monster that has been summoned to do a thing. But he's a really good version of that. He's got a great look. His origin is very cool. He's like this legendary thing that's been trapped beyond the Speed Force. Um, he is the first and potentially only person in this show to exhibit the ability to grow without eating Imoyokan. Like, you know, he's sort of in that zone. Like, he is a good version of... Let's say he is a good version of Thunder from Die Ranger. Yes. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good... And I think we can go, like, well above Thunder, but, like, he sort of fills that same role. The person that I'm thinking of who is sort of in that Iron Mask Choryu zone, but maybe fills the, the same kind of role as Ila Quinta, is Meteor Bem. Okay, yeah, I, I can do that. Does that make sense? That. It totally makes sense, and I do like Ellie Kinter quite a bit more than Meteor Bem. Quite a bit more, okay. So... Did you forget, Dave, that Meteor Bem was a monster made out of a meteor that was specifically immune to Bradonic Waves? And that he destroyed the entire, like, uh, Jet Force base? Okay, those are all... Those things are very cool. Um... Ella Quinta has a way cooler look. He does. He absolutely does. So, although actually, although I, I, I said I liked him a lot more, I do like him more. They're only a few spots away. Yeah. So. So between Iron Mask Choryu, we've got Evil Mastermind Genius Karuda. Who I also love. And we've got Barra Micron. Barra Micron is also really neat. I am actually going to say, I'm going to say beneath Evil Mastermind Genius Karuda and but above above Bear Micron. Yeah, I, I like that, Dave. So that so if we put it between those two, then Ila Quinta becomes our new number thirty nine on the list. That is correct. Now, will I ever be able to say no, his 38, name? No, thirty eight. Thirty eight. Thirty eight. Will I ever be able to say his name without accidentally uh ac- saying La Quinta, like the La Quinta in? No, I won't. But on the other hand, the sixth episode of this show was recorded in a La Quinta Inn. And so I don't think that's a bad thing. There you go. Anyway, so that, Dave, that now is going to do it for another episode of License to Car Ranger. Before we finish up here, I'd like to remind you all that you can email the show at supersentirebrothers at gmail.com. If you want to get any updates on future episodes or check out the things that we've mentioned on the show, we are on Twitter at supersentibros. If you like the show, please remember that shining in the iTunes review section, there are five stars. Rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you find the show. That would be super cool of you. The Super Sentai Brothers are a production of Retrograde Orbit Radio. To catch any of the other great Retrograde Orbit Radio shows, you can do that all at retrogradeorbitradio.com. Once again, we are the Super Sentai Brothers. I'm Matt. I'm Dave. And we'll see you next week for the greatest show on Earth.